the Justice Secretary has launched an urgent investigation into prison security following a damning report by an undercover reporter from The Times. Head of Investigations at The Times, Paul Morgan Bentley, was hired by HMP Bedford, where he worked for eight days amid a nationwide staffing shortage. Uh, during his time there, he noted a severe lack of security measures, including the absence of basic searches and vetting procedures for new hires. The prison has airport-style security on the front gate, which should mean that everyone entering is searched thoroughly for contraband, including drugs and weapons. However, when I arrived for my shifts, I found this was often not happening. I decided to keep a video diary. This morning, I arrived at the prison. There was literally no one on security. There was that one OSG at reception, showed her my ID, and then I walked through. He also revealed that prisoners openly smoked drugs in their cell and dangerous tools were kept there, including knives, uh, and they were left all around the prison as construction workers were not being searched properly. Well, joining us now is Richard Garside, director of the Centre for Crime and Justice Studies. Richard, great to have you on. I mean, people assume that when you go to prison, your rights are restricted and it's supposed to be a pretty sterile and strict environment in which you're supposed to be punished for the crimes you have committed. And you assume as well that security was the foremost uh, a concern in a prison. And yet here we are, knives hanging around, drugs going in and out, no one even being checked on the door. I mean, that's ludicrous, isn't it? Yeah, well, I remember a conversation I had with a very experienced prison governor a few years ago, and he said to me uh, something along the lines of, you show me a security system, I'll show you how you can get around it. So, you know, there's not going to be any security system in a prison that's going to prevent all, all drugs or other things getting in or indeed, you know, in, on occasions people smuggling other items in. But yeah, this is a pretty shocking, uh, a very embarrassing story, obviously, for the government and a pretty shocking story. And it is clearly important because, you know, at the end of the day, there's lots of people in prison with drug habits. Uh, not great if, if drugs can easily be smuggled in, weapons and other kind of implements that could be used to harm prisoners and prison staff. So yeah, I mean, it's a it's a pretty shocking um, story. Not a huge surprise, I think, to to those who follow prisons closely. They're in a complete mess. Uh, you know, massive underinvestment, staff shortages, and all the rest. So, you know, it's a terrible situation. Uh, I mean, they didn't even make uh, basic security checks on Paul uh, when he applied <laughs> to get the job. So he got him. Check his LinkedIn page. Yeah, this is a. Uh, uh, um... <laughs> Paul Morgan Bentley, Times reporter, just applied to an agency because they get these sort of assistant guards from agencies, which in itself I would suggest may be questionable. But at the very least, whoever you're going to hire on that basis, check them out. They didn't check them out. As he said, one press of a button would have revealed to the authorities that Paul Morgan Bentley was a reporter on the Times newspaper. However, there were no security checks. Anyone could have got this job. Presumably this is happening uh, on a regular basis. This is outrageous, isn't it? I mean, you have to assume it's not the only case, yeah. And, you know, there's been a bit of a problem actually across a number of criminal justice agencies. So uh, in the last year or two, there's been huge pressure to um, recruit more police officers, for example. And there have been real concerns that basically effectively in the rush to get more police officers, we're seeing the recruitment of racists, misogynists and people with links to organised crime. Um, prison's the same situation. I mean, you know, the reality is you can probably earn more money and certainly have a less stressful job um, stacking shelves at your local supermarket than um, working in some prison grade post. So there's a real challenge with getting people in to work in prisons. Uh, there's a real shortage of staff and, um, you know, people are cutting corners. So and, you know, it does concern me that, you know, the, the only real kind of vetting seems to be with the criminal records. You know, there's lots of people um, who commit offences or are involved in all sorts of stuff who don't have a criminal record. So if your only test of whether somebody is an appropriate person to have working in prisons is do they have a criminal record, then that is a very, very low bar. 
is. We, we always hear, don't we, about uh, whenever we've got something going wrong in the UK every day, every second, every microsecond, uh, that it's the fault of underinvestment. But is this not also sort of twinned with the fact that we've had a huge explosion in the prison population? That when you look at the prison estate across uh, England and Wales, that the amount of cells now left is sort of absolutely marginal. It's like 88,000 odd pr uh, prison cells in total. And of that, there's about 100 odd uh, that can house prisons that are still empty. But then you look at the foreign born population in prison and it's almost one in nine. And you think to yourself, someone needs to do basic mathematics here and either build some big new super prisons, deport foreign born convicts who frankly shouldn't be in this country. Um, and that is where the investment needs to be going. Well, yeah, I think it's it's a range of things. I mean, if I was going to pick one population group in the prison system that really we should be looking at, it's prisoners on so on so what's called recall. So you've been released from prison, you've um, done something, it's not necessarily committed another crime. It could just be missing an appointment or or other things, and then you're sent back to prison because you've breached your release conditions. Now, you know, back in the early '90s, about there were about a hundred people in prison who had been recalled. It's now in the thousands. And so, you know, I think that would be where I would say we could really put some effort in just reducing the number of recalls. But you're right, there has been a massive underinvestment in the prison estate. Um, a few years ago, the government set a target to build 10,000 more prison places. And in total, I think they delivered about 200. And one of the reasons here is that effectively the government and the prison service, they're a bit like the man in the boat where he's kind of, there's water coming in at the base and he's bailing it out and he's just constantly trying to kind of keep afloat. So there are a number, a lot of prison cells are going out of service because they're being mad, badly maintained and they're reaching the end of their life and they can't actually build enough, frankly, to, to keep up. And yeah, you're right. We, we've seen a huge increase in the number of people going to prison over recent years. And I think that is something that we do need to kind of have a think about because you can't just keep building ever more prisons, not least of all, because most people quite rightly don't want to live next to one. Uh, that's the point taken. However, they, I think there is about six prisons that it seems to me they've been building for about 50 years now. They never <laughs> seem to get completed. It's quite clear we do need more. Uh, but to, to go back to Bedford, uh, um, uh, Richard, it, it, it's, a, it's got 400 prisoners in it. It's a Category B, which means that among those prisoners are very serious criminals, you know, murderers, rapists. Uh, and when Paul Morgan Bentley uh, landed his uh, prestige job there, uh, he was warned uh, that one of the problems with the prison was a pandemic of unlocked doors. Uh, and apparently the most recent person to uh, man to escape from Bedford jail woke up one morning and while stretching his arms outside his cell, noticed that the wing door was open, thought he might walk through it, walked through about eight more doors, uh, all open, got to the uh, gates of the prison where the prison guard waved at him, assuming he was a prison visitor. Uh, that is the level of a lack of security at Bedford Prison. Now, that, of course, you know, staffing is clearly a problem, but it sounds to me that that kind of uh, lackadaisical approach is the result of a staff, uh, albeit depleted, that is dispirited and has ceased to care. Is this a problem? Well, what, yeah, I mean, what happened, you know, roughly speaking from about 2010 on when there was a, a huge pressure to reduce budgets is um, a lot of more senior prison officers um, left the service. Now, some would argue that wasn't a bad thing because within those more senior or more experienced prison officers were probably quite a number of people who perhaps frankly shouldn't be in the service anyway because of their attitudes and, and you know, and, and, and all the rest. So there was a kind of a, a, a significant decline in the number of prison officers. And so there is now a significant shortage of experienced officers who know the system well, who can also nurture and help new officers coming in. And the new officers are coming in are often very young. Uh, they're very inexperienced. It's really quite frightening for, for young officers, often with literally a few weeks training. And they're suddenly on a, on a cell with often some much older prisoners who've been there for a long time, know how to manipulate them in the system. So it is a bit of a kind of, it's a real problem actually at the moment in our prison system. And it is that kind of mixture of just massive underinvestment in the estate for many years. We kind of effectively, we have a political commitment to a much larger prison population than we actually, the budgets are able to sustain. I mean, this is a problem across a number of public services, not just prisons, um, with no end in sight and a understaffed, 
demoralized and inexperienced workforce and it's a real you know it's a bit of a toxic combination uh, Richard, great to talk to you. Thank you so much for your time. That's Richard Garside, Director of the Centre for Crime and Justice Studies.